namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa buddhang tamang sanghang namasami I'm very happy indeed to be uh, here at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery once again and uh, being together with uh, many familiar faces and a uh, few new ones. Uh, uh, as uh, Ajahn Karunadamo was saying, uh, I have uh, been coming about once every two years uh, in the last uh, little while and uh, that's the, the plan that we have to continue into the future but of course the future is uncertain. That's the, uh, the idea. So uh, uh, Lumpur Pasanno would come to England one year and I would come to, uh, to California another year and we would just keep trading off until one of us falls off our perch. <laughs> so we'll see what happens in that respect. Uh, one of the, the questions that uh, came up in conversation uh, today um, with some people I was talking with earlier on I thought might be a, a useful area to, to speak about in terms of uh, some Dhamma reflections this evening and this is uh, how we relate to, to work and activity and things that we uh, engage with in our life so the, the, um, <coughs> the things that we do whether that's the livelihood we have the, the, uh, whether it's um, say making a journey, traveling from one place to another, um, whether it's sitting down to meditate, whether it's uh, a, um, or engaging in a meditation retreat. Um, it's very easy for us to make uh, the, the things that we do into a, a, a chore or a burden or something that's stressful. And so it's, uh, or like at tea time, people asking about uh, do you, what do you think about retirement? Are you looking forward to retirement? <laughs> and uh, it's a very strong ethic in our society. It's the, thank God it's Friday. Um, looking, I'm looking forward to the weekend, or I'm really glad when I'll have my holiday, or oh, I can't wait for the bell to ring. Um, yeah. I can't wait to get on the retreat. I can't wait for the retreat to be over. <laughs> um, probably a few of us have... Even professional meditators have these, uh, <laughs> these, uh, these feelings. So that, uh, um, I feel that's something that's very useful to, uh, to look at. And one of the things that I point out in this respect is how curious it is that the most peaceful moment of the meditation is when the bell rings. I'm not reading anybody's mind, but uh, it's not just because our, our knees have been um, say, given relief from uh, stress and discomfort, but when the bell rings, isn't it curious how something in the heart goes, ah, right? Thank goodness that's over. <laughs> Even though the, the meditation is supposed to be when we're being peaceful. That's supposed to be the, the, the good bit, but it's mysterious how when the bell goes, there's a feeling of relief or, or release. And uh, uh, what I feel that points to uh, is an important principle, which is that the, the, feel of me, the feeling of me having to do something, me engaged in some task, even if the task is me meditating, that, uh, that has a kind of stress to it. And so we relate to peace being... Uh, uh, that's that feeling of, oh, wouldn't it be nice when I don't have to bother? When I don't have to do this anymore? I'm really looking forward to having the opportunity to, to not bother with this. So the very way that the mind phrases this, and again, I'm not reading anybody's mind, rest assured. I don't have those kind of abilities, but this is generally how we think. So that <coughs> we, we look forward to that space over there when I don't have to bother with this. And that's attractive, that, that's appealing. But I would suggest that the, that uh, that kind of peace, where um, 
uh, I don't have to bother or I don't have to I don't have to deal with this I don't have to be uh, engaged in this this activity this work or this um, this uh, this journey um, that the the quality of peace doesn't really come from when that activity or that that work or that effort is over but uh, it, it's really to be found somewhere else because as uh, most of us notice uh, you get to the end of, of one um, one effort and then you get to the weekend and then the weekend can turn out to be more busy and active than the work week. Uh, how many people have retired and found themselves far more busy than they ever were when they were uh, engaged in paid, paid employment, right? It's a, the kind of thing that's, that's, that's uh, said many, many times. So I feel that the... Um, the uh, the important thing, the the most useful thing to to consider in this respect is what is the attitude with which we work. If if any kind of work or engagement is somehow stressful, and if and if peace only comes from when we're sort of we're disengaged or switched off or 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 not feeling, not doing, um, uh, is that a, a peace that's really reliable? Is it is it um, say dependable? Is it something that can be sustained. Um, the uh, the instruction that we are often given in meditation is to to let go or to be uh, to, to uh, practice non-attachment, to they uh, be the the witness of our mind states. And so again, we can relate to that, that flow of activity I'm just watching I'm just uh, I'm just uh, observing I'm not I'm not really engaged here I'm just I'm just being the the one who knows I'm being the observer the, the silent witness and, ma- and many times in many uh, meditation retreats or, or books of, of the Dhamma teaching it gives that kind of advice and I've probably given it <coughs> myself <laughs> it's, it's very very common but what that again that uh, from a, in, in a slightly different way that can um, encourage a quality of, 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 of attitude whereby any kind of engagement, any kind of doing is an intrusion on your peace and if you really want to be uh, awake if you really want to practice non-attachment then there's a kind of numbing or, or dissociating or a freezing you don't do anything as if any kind of doing or choosing or engaging was a disturbance of that, uh, that quality of peace that makes sense? Is that familiar territory? So, I have a little campaign against all of that. <laughs> <laughs> you could probably see that coming. <laughs> a, a, a kind of um, uh, ongoing effort to, to rejig the, uh, the perception. Because, um, in a couple of different ways, uh, when, we, uh, when we, we look at, say, the, the Buddha's life as an example, uh, if we take, uh, if we have confidence in the Buddha's enlightenment, that uh, sitting under the Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya, then he completely freed his heart from greed, hatred, and delusion. He was totally enlightened. How did he then choose to travel all around northeast India? How did he have the creative imagination to give the thousands and thousands of Dhamma teachings with amazing illustrations and similes and? Is, uh, and the lists, you know, where did he come up with all those lists from? You know, if he was totally enlightened and uh, his heart was completely, uh, uh, say, embodying the quality of peace, where did all that doing come from? How did he create the Sangha, the monastic or the order of monks, the order of nuns, the lay community, you know, the 84,000 sections of Dhamma teachings in the, in the Tipitaka? That's a lot of stuff. <laughs> He travelled a lot of miles. He went to a lot of places, established a lot of monasteries, and uh, and it was so thoroughly done that it's still active two and a half thousand years later. That's a lot of doing, a lot of very creative and thoughtful and uh, and effective doing. So, if we take his life as an example, how could all of that doing and creative activity and use of imagination and effort and engagement? How could that be an intrusion on his peace? How could that be an, uh, something that was, you know, a, a burden or stressful? If we uh, if we take the ba- you know, the basic understanding that he he was uh, 
unable to experience uh, dukkha, stress and, and, and suffering, yeah, how is it possible to be carrying out all of that, that work and uh, all of that, say, um, uh, uh, the uh, affective and uh, imaginative engagement with society and, uh, uh, and for it to still be alive today? So the, uh, the, the thing that makes a difference in my perception is not whether there's activity or inactivity but the, the way the mind picks it up and that if you look at the, uh, the Buddha's teaching on, on right effort, Samavayamo in the Eightfold Path, that, uh, that kind of gives us a clue in a way, it gives, gives us a template for the, the Buddha's attitude towards this. So you have in this, uh, not to get too technical, but uh, he divided that right effort or the skillful effort into four different pieces. So there's firstly the effort to restrain unwholesome qualities from arising. And secondly, uh, if unwholesome qualities have arisen, like greed or anger or fear or, or, uh, or as a aversion, uh, to let it go. And then the third one is to cultivate the wholesome, loving kindness or wisdom, concentration, compassion, so forth. And then if wholesome qualities have arisen, to sustain them. So you have um, restrain, uh, restraining, letting go, cultivating, maintaining. Those are the four aspects of right effort. So that looks like a lot of me doing something. I shouldn't have so much anger. I should stop that ang those angry feelings from arising. If I feel angry or I feel jealous or I feel af uh, afraid or lustful, I should let that go. Um, I should have more loving kindness and compassion. I, I, I need more wisdom and uh, I need to keep this loving kindness going. Isn't that familiar? You know, haven't you probably sat here and heard me and others talk in these kind of ways? <clears throat> the, um, the way that the mind picks it up, uh, our habit is to put it all in terms of self-view. I have got an, uh, a, a habit of getting angry or I've, I have a, a jealousy problem or I have a fear problem or a restlessness problem. I need to get rid of that. So the, the I am, I have, I do, kind of sneaks in the back door and, and takes that over. And that <clears throat> if right effort is uh, really right, is really samma, really in tune with, with, with reality, then rather than that, uh, the restraining of the unwholesome and the cultivating of the wholesome and so on, rather than that being me who's got this anger problem or this fear problem or this greed problem that I need to get rid of that or to, uh, to uh, get more uh, compassion or get more concentration and get jhanas or get insight. Um, <clears throat> instead it's seen there is this unwholesome quality of, of anger or fear and uh, if, that, if that comes into being then that causes disharmony in this life and disharmony in other people's lives and, and in the world. Therefore, let, let there be the effort for it to, re, to be restrained. There doesn't have to be an I or me or mine in that. If uh, that feeling of, of, of uh, anger or fear or jealousy and lust or uh, restlessness, jealousy and so on, if that's arisen, rather than, oh, I'm feeling jealous, I, I should let go of this, here is jealousy. There's the awareness of this jealous feeling or this restless feeling or this averse feeling. It, this has arisen. It doesn't have to be called me or my jealousy problem or my experience of fear or I'm afraid. It's like, here is fear, it has arisen. Or uh, let there be loving kindness rather than I need more loving kindness. Loving kindness is a wholesome quality. If uh, this or that practice is followed, then it arises. And if that's followed, then that brings benefit to this being, to other beings, to, to, to the world. It, it's something that is conducive towards peace and clarity and skillful experiences, skillful qualities. So uh, <clears throat> what this means is that those, uh, those aspects of work can be f uh, fully uh, exercised, can be uh, actualized without any kind of self-view, without it being a, a me who's the doer. And that uh, is what I, uh, would, uh, I would suggest makes, is the thing that makes a difference. So if we can learn how to to work and to engage and to guide uh, these lives based on 
mindfulness and wisdom based on an attunement to the time, the place, the situation, then uh, we can do a lot of work. We can, we can uh, go places. We can use our imagination. We can uh, be very effective in functioning in society and in the, in the workplace, in the family. And that, uh, uh, I would say, doesn't carry the same kind of stressfulness or the sense of, of burden when there is the, the feeling of I and me and mine. So, <coughs> that we'll have time for discussion and questions and answers uh, at the end of the talk. So, uh, if you want to talk about that <laughs> uh, uh, or, or disagree, then you're quite at liberty to. But I would suggest that's, that's the, uh, the aspect that makes all the difference. So that uh, when we learn how to work in that way and to guide our, our actions based on that quality of mindful uh, awareness, attunement to the time, the place, the situation. But it's not me dealing with my problems or me trying to get uh, my spiritual qualities developed, but rather here is the awake mind uh, seeing the way things are and responding uh, e e uh, effectively, then uh, that, uh, uh, say, engagement is it's peaceful in its activity. You don't have to uh, get to the end of the, the walk and then sit down to be peaceful. You're, you're peaceful as the body is walking. <laughs> you don't have to wait till the, the work day ends. You don't have to wait till the Dhamma talk ends before you can be peaceful. But uh, even as the, the talk is going on, as the journey is continuing, there's a quality of, of peace and, and ease and attunement uh, right there. So, if uh, there's a uh, if there's a, a uh, say a recognition of this and s steering the mind towards this quality of uh, letting go of self-view and functioning from a place of of selflessness, there's a, a, a radical effect upon the way we, we live our lives, the way that we, we can function in the world. We're not always looking for peace to be an absence of activity or an absence of noise or an absence of of um, a responsibility, but rather, even as those things are present, there is there is peacefulness. There, there's an ease, there's a, a relaxation. Though, so with respect to the meditation and this I idea of non-attachment, they are or letting go. Uh, this other aspect uh, is uh, closely closely related, I would say, because the and what it can point to is. Uh, Oh, I'm just watching. There's this feeling has arisen. Or there's this, this sensation in the body. I'm just watching, um, and that people say, well, in the world, in our lives, you know, should we, when we see uh, injustice in the in society, or we see you know, a conflict going on, if we practice non-attachment, are we supposed to just sort of sit back and and do nothing, or kind of uh, be be neutral, and uh, and so, or in the meditation, that uh, uh, I'm, I'm just watching this feeling in the body, or I'm just watching this, uh, this uh, um, say emotion in the mind, and even though one is sincerely trying to follow that that instruction to to practice non-attachment, or to 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 uh, let go, or to be the watcher, be the observer, uh, I've, what uh, is often happening is that our our natural responsivity is being unplugged, is kind of being deadened, so that we're creating a kind of false abstraction or, or dissociation, if those are not two long words. <laughs> the, there's a kind of um, uh, numbing, a uh, kind of deadening uh, of our uh, innate responsivity, uh, and that the, the, the intention is very sincere. Oh, you know, the Ajahn told me I should just watch. Okay, I'll just watch. <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm practicing non-attachment. But uh, uh, your, in, your capacity to act is part of the way things are. So, I'll say that again. <laughs> so, your, your capacity to act is not an intrusion on the way things are. It's part of the way things are. So, like in, uh, again, I was chatting earlier today with someone and there's this line in one of T.S. Eliot's poems, the, uh, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Do I dare disturb the universe? You know, that should, I should I do something? Should I step in and, and, and in, uh, intrude upon the, the universe? Should I disturb the universe? And I would say, wrong question. You, know, you are the universe. <laughs> this, and your, your capacity to act is 
the 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 responsivity of the of the natural order. Uh, what part of your body and mind is not part of nature already? You know, the, we we might say, well, I'm just watching the way things are. This, I'm just being the observer. <laughs> but the observer is also part of the way things are. Does that make sense? So uh, rather than uh, uh, intentional action being some kind of disturbance or intrusion upon nature, that uh, recognizing we are nature, we are we are the universe. This is um, uh, a, uh, a living natural system that every aspect of our body and mind uh, uh, and our heart is part of. It, how can it not be? Yet even things that are, are quote unquote um, fabricated or, or synthetic, you know, <laughs> that you know, plastic is is uh, made from uh, uh, oil that's come out of the ground and has been put through refineries, probably in Richmond and. <laughs> Kind of fed through various machines and boop, you know, plastic. So even plastic is part of the natural order. So that the um, when we see that our capacity to act is also part of the way things are, then rather than this sort of just watching or just being the observer or, or practicing non-attachment, meaning that kind of freezing or dissociation or, or abstra- abstraction, like trying to turn yourself into a kind of t- uh, CCTV camera, just, I'm just recording data here, you know, I'm just <laughs> observing the data of my life. Um, yeah. <clears throat> then, I'm kind of exaggerating it, but we can be like that. You know, th- I'm, I'm supposed to just observe, you know, arising, passing away, arising, passing away, arising, passing away. You know. And then you think, well, <clears throat> the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the hall is on fire, Ajahn. The, uh, <laughs> Last year there was these huge fires um, that were encroaching right at the edges of the Abhayagiri um, uh, forest. Uh, the, uh, one of the, the, the novices was telling me he was the first one to spot it at about half past one in the morning and he's kind of running through the forest and he's got a wall of flames coming over the, coming over the ridge. Um, in a, the appropriate thing to do is not to be sitting in Yakuti going, uh, heat arising, flames arising, <laughs> smoke arising, so- sound of alarm horn arising, um, knocking at my door arising, passing away. That, uh, it's like, get out of your cootie! Yeah. Run! <laughs> the, the forest is on fire. You know, leave now! You know. That's the appropriate thing to do. You know, so that, uh, and I, again, I'm kind of exaggerating it, but uh, we can be like this. You know, that we can, well, I'm supposed to just observe arising and passing away. And, you know, or as a, uh, Ajahn Sumedha would often use as, as an example, someone says, oh, uh, you know, that, uh, oh, we just heard that um, you know, your, your mother has passed away. Oh, well, all that arises passes away. <laughs> you say, no, it's your mother just died. You know, you, it's, you, it's not just uh, another sankara arising and passing away. That's something that your heart, your life is connected to. And to uh, think, well, I'm just supposed to be, I just observe, you know, all things... All conditions arise and pass away. That was my mother. Um, so that is a, a, a very crass or gross example of, uh, of how you can take a, an idea or a theory and then mishandle it or mi- misinterpret it. And even though we feel that we're doing the right thing or we feel that we're following the instructions as we should, we're, we're kind of picking it up in a, in a foolish way. So that when uh, we recognize that the, uh, the, the quality of um, intention uh, and uh, the mind's uh, awareness of, of the world, you know, they're one of the aspects of, of the, the Buddha nature, the Buddha mind, the, is that the Buddha is the knower of the world, the loka we do. Uh, that's also that the, the Buddha is the knower of the world, but also that... Uh, that mind is engaged with the world. Another of the Buddha's qualities is vijja charana sampano. So the vijja means uh, awareness or awakened uh, knowing. Charana is conduct. So the Buddha isn't just the, the knower of the world, also that Buddha uh, wisdom, that Buddha awareness is manifested in conduct. That the, the, the vijja and charana, the awareness and the activity, they're, they're two they're two faces of the same quality, like the front and the back of the hand. 
that they, they, they go together. They are they're kind of a two parts of the same whole. So when there is that quality of awakened awareness, then part of that is the responsivity uh, of this uh, this li- this life, this uh, uh, center of experience in relationship to the world, to what it sees. You know, flames coming over the ridge, right? Act, <laughs> get out of your kuti and come to the, the the kind of the meeting point, the the fire meeting point. That's what you do. You you uh, you hear that your mother's died. Yes, all sankaras arise and pass away, but this is your mother. So you step forward and uh, and engage with with the family and uh, with your own heart with those those feelings. So in this respect, uh, the one of the ways I, I like to to talk about this is that. Uh, the 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 life that we have is part of a self-adjusting universe that uh, it, it adjusts itself so that letting go say for example in meditation and you bring attention you have a pain in your leg and it's getting more and more intense uh, and that uh, you know the teacher has said uh, you shouldn't uh, it's not a good idea to fidget and just be moving around as soon as you feel discomfort um, uh, it's good to be patient with the feeling of pain. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll follow that advice and practice patience. But also, part of that, uh, that feeling of pain, is the, uh, I say, the awareness of the body's limitations. And at a certain point, there's the, uh, the awareness of, well, this is, this is painful feeling, but this joint now is, uh, is um, apparently... Uh, stressed to the, the 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 degree that this um, it feels like real damage is about to be done. Therefore, uh, <coughs> the uh, say knowing that receiving that signal or getting that sense, yeah, that okay, that that pain has been uh, uh, accepted. I'm not fighting against it. I'm not resenting it. I'm not, I'm not hating it. But it's bringing the message: time to move. <laughs> and so then. The, the 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 practice of letting go or non-attachment doesn't mean therefore just stay with the painful feeling. It means let the body move. So uh, that's just you know one uh, uh, say familiar example. And so oftentimes when people say, well, what should I, you know, I'm in this terrible situation in my my workplace. You know that people are being really uh, aggressive with each other, or someone is sort of helping themselves to the office supplies. You know, should I just practice non-attachment you know uh, they're, they're kind of carrying out all this thievery should I should I just let go and or you know what, what, what's the what's the Buddhist thing to do or what's the right thing to do and with the again with the idea that oh if I was practicing letting go or non-attachment I would just let them carry on stealing all them <laughs> all the uh, the office supplies but perhaps that's not the wise thing to do or the appropriate thing to do. Perhaps the appropriate thing, the way of letting go, is to take action. You let go of your hesitancy. You let go of your, of your kind of fear of being criticized or, or, um, uh, or of, uh, say, being disliked. And instead, <laughs> you, the, there's a response. There's a, uh, that natural responsivity is allowed to in- engage. So I could give many, many other examples, but I think you... You probably get the point. So that uh, this kind of process uh, is what I call unentangled participating. So there's a lack of entanglement. The mind is not getting caught up in the complications of the world. Uh, it's unentangled, but it's also participating. It's that the mind is attuned to the world. It knows the world, but it's not entangled with the world. It's not caught up in the complications. It's not limited by the world. And so this is, I feel, one of the, the beautiful aspects of, of Buddhist practice and the Buddha's teaching. It, it uh, points out how we can both fully attune the heart to the world, but also be uh, uh, unburdened by the world. We can, uh, uh, say, uh, attune our life to the lives of others and to the, the, the work that we can do and the, the, the way we can we can help and uh, be a benefit to ourselves and others, but without making that into a, 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 a stressful duty or something that, that's, that's a, 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 an obstacle or a challenge or, or, or burdensome or stressful to us in any way. So to the thinking mind, it's, uh, 
it's, it can be confusing. Well, do I care or do I not care? <laughs> does it matter or does it not matter? And, uh, uh, and the answer is, well, both. <laughs> like we were having the conversation at, at uh, tea time today, that sense of, oh, uh, and I was recounting the, these two very short poems that uh, arose in my mind when the, the ver- literally day one of a Bainagiri monastery, 22 years ago or so, was the first poem was in the midst of everything there is nothing uh, right. <coughs> in, yeah, and then the second poem was in the midst of nothing there is everything <laughs> the, uh, uh, and in a way it's, it's like binary vision when we have two eyes then we can see three dimensionally so that one eye is like everything matters the other eye is nothing matters <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, and that if we have both the, rather than interfering with each other, having that that binary vision helps the the the, the uh, in the the visual world the eye to see a, a three dimensional picture. So it spiritually it's exactly the same. There's this quality of of say caring for uh, the world that we experience, caring for the the uh, <coughs> the say the infinite number of living beings and the uh, the the living world. And what we can do, uh, the capacities that we have in the in the world, and then <coughs> the the other aspect is then not clinging, not grasping, not not identifying with the world. So there's a there's the vicha, there's the awareness, the the quality of knowing and uh, and say clear seeing of the way things are, but there and then that clear seeing informs activity or the way that we work, the charana, the conduct, what we say, what we do, the choices that we make. And that uh, with those two together, even though they might seem to be opposed when they, when they are balanced, then what we have is the, the middle way of three-dimensional vision. We have that, that uh, mysterious middleness of being able to, uh, say, uh, <coughs> engage in a, uh, with great effort and commitment and sincerity but to not be uh, bound or limited or, or burdened by that in any way one of the, the maybe the la- last thing to, uh, to add before we uh, say have time for some question and, and discussion and such like is um, the uh, the, the, in a way to, to stress the quality of self-view and how this is the, the, the troublemaker <laughs> the rel- I call it, self-view is the reliable troublemaker and so it's so matter of fact to, to think in terms of self I, mean, I am Ajahn Amaro, this is Ajahn Kurunadama yeah, it's uh, Venerable Pesalo yeah. this, <coughs> we have names, this is my identity this is this is Jennifer, probably checking her phone. <laughs> my son. <laughs> I'm engaging with my child. <laughs> so this, uh, we have a name, we have an identity, we have a kind of a social role. It's all it's kind of automatic. We say, oh, this is who I am. It's so ordinary and, and every day. Uh, I am so many years old. This is my address. This is my nationality. This is my gender. This is my occupation. You know, this is my place of my birth and, and so on and so forth and that's so ordinary and every day uh, but <clears throat> one of the great strengths of, of Buddhist teaching and Buddhist meditation is the insight into not self and so this is not uh, the, the teaching on not self again is easily misunderstood as you know, people can think well am I supposed to believe that I don't exist <laughs> you know, that, or that uh, I don't I, you know, I'm, I'm not really here I don't have a self but uh, for for most people, the the one the, the most real thing in all of our lives is this experience of of experiencing, <laughs> right? That uh, that's the most real thing for all of us is that we, we know we, we are we are feeling this life of ours. That, that's the most real thing for most people that uh, that we <clears throat> that something certainly seems to be going on. <laughs> but the the teaching of uh, of not self is not about trying to believe that we don't exist or that uh, we haven't got a, 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 a self as a sort of 
metaphysical thing, but rather it's shifting the, the view from seeing uh, in terms of I and me and mine and to seeing in terms of nature. So that, yes, there is a body, and I say, this is my body, but really the body belongs to nature. It's breathing all the time. And air is, oxygen is going in, carbon dioxide is going out. It, it's part of the living system. We eat food. Uh, we feel the force of gravity. We, we relate to other human beings. These are all parts of a natural process. So that we, uh, when we say I, or me, or mine, that we're not trying to pretend that there, there is no experience of, of, uh, of, of knowing or that our life isn't happening, but rather we're shifting the, the way that those aspects of life are, are named and categorized. So rather than seeing in terms of, of self, of this individual independent entity, <coughs> we're looking at this life as part of a natural order. But, uh, this is a, a, a part of, a, of an organic living system. So when we shift the view from self-centered, so that uh, I've got an anger problem, I've got a fear problem, or I've got, I, I've got my mind is full of agitated thoughts, to shift the view that, well, the mind is capable of thinking, and here they are. <laughs> the mind is capable of fear, it can experience anger, it can experience hope, and it can experience love. And, and here it is, the, these qualities are part of the natural order, they come into being, they take shape, they dissolve. They're not personal. When we, we uh, say, have that first insight, and, and the, the Buddha's teaching on Vipassana, insight meditation, aims right at this, uh, this change of view, this change of, of ways of, of seeing, and it helps the mind to recognize, oh, I call it my thought, but really it's just like the sound in the street, it arises, it does its thing, it passes away. I say this is my body, but how, how, you know, what's the thing that's doing the owning? You know, it's really just this, it has this, these qualities and it, it does its thing, it has its forms, its, its feelings, it's part of nature. There isn't really a, a, a me that's definable or findable that is the owner. Uh, and so that it's changing the view from a self-centered perspective to a nature-centered perspective. So the first level of, of, uh, uh, of that kind of identification is uh, what you can say is the I am the body, I am the personality. Uh, and so the insight meditation, Vipassana, is a powerful tool that helps the, the mind to be brought to that, to question that identification. I, you know, I'm a woman, I'm a man, I'm old, I'm young, I'm tall, I'm short. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm a doctor, I'm a monk, I'm a layperson. All those I am's, and so that the letting go of self-view, the breakthrough of, uh, uh, of, the, of the heart to recognize these cannot be anything other than convenient fictions. That they, they can't have any solidity. That there's no way that they, they have any uh, absolute and ultimate value. Um, so like nationality, I use this as an example very often. So I, uh, I was born in England, so I, I started out being, being British. Uh, then I got American citizenship a few years ago. So now I'm American as well. So I have two nationalities. So where am I from? You know, which country do I belong to? Am I American or am I British? So, well, you're really British, I John. <laughs> But you know, my, my mother's father was German, and, her, uh, and my mother's mother was Belgian. So I'm a quarter Belgian, a quarter German, and half English. But then how, where does the American come in? <laughs> so what am I? You know? uh, <clears throat> so the, the quality of nationality, or, or that uh, people who've uh, uh, immigrated into the U.S. that uh, you know you were German and you gave up your German passport, became American. Or, um, that <clears throat> well, I was that, and now I'm this. It's a it's a convenient designation. It's just a human agreement to say, okay, here is a document that says this person was born so many years ago, and <coughs> this is their name, this is their number, this this defines this particular entity. Boop. That's all. There's nothing solid or permanent there. So what we call sakaya ditti or self-view, that's defining that, uh, that insight. Uh, 
um, into that feeling of I'm the body, I'm the personality, this is who and what I am. So that uh, when that is seen through, when that is fully understood and let go of, that's the, the first, uh, say, um, the first level of, of realization or the, the first sort of entry point into the, the path of liberation, what the, the Buddha called the first of the ten fetters. And so that, that is, uh, say, the heart finding its way towards uh, enlightenment, towards full liberation. <clears throat> Another aspect of this, though, is that uh, much further down the line, there's a, a more subtle quality of identification. That the, just the feeling of I-ness, me-ness and minus that's not associated with being uh, of a particular nationality or a gender or an age or a, it's not associated with any personal qualities. So, and again, this is something that, that uh, people experience in meditation that when the mind is very, very quiet, uh, very, very, very clear, very peaceful, there can be the, the sense of it's absolutely obvious that the body is not self, or that these stories that you remember, that these are not a person. These are, they, they don't belong to a person. They're not a self, they don't belong to a self. The, the sensations, there isn't really an owner of these flow of sensations and perceptions. They're just arising and passing. So it can be uh, really clear that the, the body, the personality, these stories, these are not who and what, what, what we are. But still there can be the sense of yeah, but I'm experiencing, mm -hmm. I'm meditating, I, I, I am reflecting on these thoughts being not self. <laughs> <laughs> I, there's an I feeling, but that I feeling is not associated with, uh, with a, an age, a name, a, a family, uh, a, a role. It's a, just the sense of, of an experience, a, a doer, a, a meditator. Uh, that there's, a, there's an I feeling, uh, I the knower, I the actor, I the, the one who's choosing, even though it's not connected to any particular thing. So that quality is called asmi mana, or the conceit of I am. So that's a lot more subtle. So sometimes in meditation, this is where uh, things can get, can get stuck or limited, where that uh, we're kind of trying to be the witness or be the one who knows, that, uh, be, the <laughs> be the meditator. So that uh, uh, the Buddha pointed to this too as, a, as an obstacle that needs to be let go of. And uh, in one particular teaching he said, to be free of the conceit, I am, to be free of asmimana, that is the greatest happiness. And that, uh, that is Nibbana. To be free of that is to realize Nibbana here and now to be free of that conceit of I am. So that uh, in this, uh, say, exploration of self-view and seeing how that's a troublemaker, to, uh, to, say, not just be looking at it at the level of the body, the personality, and those kind of the more kind of crunchy and colorful personal characteristics, but even that feeling of I-ness, the meanness and minus, to, to bring the quality of wisdom and uh, investigation to explore that and to, uh, to let that go. So then there's not a, a me who's watching or a me, an I who is the experience or an I who's a knower, but there is knowing, there is experiencing, there, there, is, there is watching, there is that participating, but there is not a sense of I and me and mine that is the, the agent or the doer. And uh, as the Buddha said, that's a, that is what brings the greatest quality of, of peacefulness. Now you might think, well, that sounds really spaced out, <laughs> and that uh, oh, that's really kind of off in the stratosphere. But if you again, if you go back to the the Buddha's life as an example, then if, if he was free of that quality of mana of conceit, um, how did he, again? How did he walk all over Bihar and Uttar Pradesh and give all those teachings and engage with all those people in such a creative and and thoughtful way? So that letting go of self, it doesn't disable us or make us less functional. Or, you know, well, if I let go of self, Ajahn, how can I get to work? You know, or how do I talk to my family? You know, if I don't exist, you know, if these are not. If the, these qualities of of self view and conceit are really let go of, that doesn't make you less functional. It makes you more functional, <laughs> more effective, and more able to act in skillful ways. So it's not like 
wisdom is a disabling uh, <laughs> condition. It is an enabling in the best possible way. So I offer these thoughts for consideration this evening, and I'm happy to open things up for uh, conversation. So we have a little bit of time, it's about 9.15, I think we'll try to wind things up around 9.30ish, so time for a few questions, if there are any in the room, yes, please yes. speak up. Yes, I have a question, um, when I was listening to you talk, I was wondering if the Buddha and all of you have an put on a business suit, let your hair grow out, and, and really be in the workforce, and still be a monk inside? I mean, Me, personally. Well, <laughs> you, can, you know what I mean, but like, can actually, can somebody actually do that, or or is it better if you step out of that, the, the entire environment, and put yourself in, in a more holy environment, to be able to be more congruent <coughs> with your eyes? I don't know if I remember how to tie a necktie. <laughs> I haven't worn trousers in 40 years. <laughs> so there will be a, a certain education process necessary. But um, uh, <clears throat> it's a, a good question, a common question. I think those kind of things, um, uh, it's up to individual preference. The, the Buddha established the monastic order and the Buddha lived as a monk. He was completely incapable of suffering, but he did choose to walk barefoot around Bihar for 40, you know, 45 years uh, as a wandering mendicant living on arms. So the, the choice of uh, monastic lifestyle is a choice of simplicity and uh, to learn to live in a way that you're living as lightly upon the earth as possible. If someone wishes to put, in, put themselves into a business suit, get the shoulders and the, the, uh, <coughs> the, the kind of look, uh, they can do that. You know, and <coughs> there are people who, uh, who do quite consciously um, function in the, the, the business world or the academic world uh, as a, a very consciously as a service, that so they they don't really feel like it's they're not invested in it in the in the in the the role, but they they l relate to it as a kind of service, um, and they see that what they can they can bring to that domain is uh, perhaps something very very useful. So, for example, an, an example, um, maybe not exactly what you were asking about, but. I met with Bill Ford of Ford Motor Company a number of years ago. Uh, and at that point, uh, he was considered a little bit too green and, and so liberal to be given anything dangerous to play with. So he was put in charge of the Ford Motor Company's charitable activities. But uh, what happened was that he became so kind of appreciated and liked and trusted that they kept giving him sort of more and more important jobs until he became the CEO of Ford Motor Company. So anyway, when I met him, he asked me, uh, uh, and it was because he was interested in Ajahn, Ch Ajahn Chah's Dhamma books, and he was very uh, keen on Ajahn Chah's teaching, so I was invited to his home to chat with him. So his question was, well, I'm kind of a great-grandson of Henry Ford, and I'm in this family, <laughs> and you know, I'm doing this job, but you know, uh, and I got, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm married, and uh, we have four kids, and and what I really want to do is to kind of go off and live in the forest in Vermont and you know grow grow cabbages and uh, and uh, do you think that's a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> and so he was, I'm kind of, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not a lot. <laughs> so 
Uh, and so, uh, you know, me as a card-carrying spiritual type, <laughs> I, I think he was expecting me to say, well, of course, you know, go to the woods and uh, live deliberately in the woods with your, and let your kids run around barefoot in the forest and have a good time. But uh, to my surprise, somewhat, I found myself saying, well, you could do that, but you also, you're in a very powerful position. You know, you, you're, you're in this family and from what I understand, you, you are well respected and uh, you have the name and uh, perhaps um, you can, within the, the scope of the Ford family and the Ford Motor Company, you can bring things into the company and the way the company operates that wouldn't come from anybody else. And he didn't like that. <laughs> I thought, you, know, you could be like the bodhisattva of the, the auto world. <laughs> I kind of you know, spiced it up a little bit. But, but, um, I, you know, but I was quite serious, really, because uh, in that sort of a role, because you could see he was a very, very good-hearted, genuine person. And, that, uh, and he did feel he was somewhat surrounded by sharks in the, and that... Uh, more kind of b bottom line uh, type business people and that uh, I said you know you have uh, just talking with you and, and, and hearing what you have to say you have really admirable you know, humane values and uh, people are, are um, say uh, are looking to you f for, for guidance so I said you know you could uh, I, I would suggest you give it a go and try it out and let yourself stay within the within the field and um the uh, uh, to a certain degree he, he did I mean I, I'm not sure whether he I don't think he's the CEO now but he did stay with it and take it on I'm not saying it's just because what I said but there you have someone whose their heart isn't really in it to sort of be a big hotshot executive and make piles of money the, it was more like well what can I what can I do within this 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 role that is handed to me I've inherited this what can I do that, that might steer things in a, in a good way? And so uh, that, um, that was a, you know, a conscious choice for him to sort of pick that up and, and do that for a certain amount of time and then to see what, what are the results that come from that. The, uh, uh, <coughs> there are some people who have been monastics for some time and then they, they feel like this doesn't really work for me anymore, I want to be more engaged, more a active in particular areas of life, and we're totally at liberty to leave at any, any time. Leaving the robe, uh, it takes about 15 seconds. <laughs> it's a very, very quick ceremony. <laughs> Putting on the tie is harder. <laughs> Putting on a tie is harder, yeah. And, uh, well, and so the... Um, if, if the heart is no longer in it, if you, if you really want to operate in a different mode of activity, then you can. It's not, a, it's not imprisoned in it. And so sometimes people go out and try the, the sort of activity in the world, and, and it works well. Sometimes they go out and give it a try, and then they, and then they think, well, oh, that didn't work. <laughs> and then they come back again. Yeah. So it's, it's a flexible system. But I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, there's a question up there. Speak up. So I have a question about attachment as it pertains to actually also the previous question about the goals and maybe even ambitions. What is, would you suggest would be the way and proper as it pertains to one's goals? The goals could range from something as being philanthropic and affecting millions of lives, or it could be more selfish and serving the ego. What are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, it's a big question. Um, one of the, th the, th the things I feel is uh, a great cause of um, mental illness and depression in, uh, in society is the extremely shallow goals that, that most of the society and education systems project for people. So that... Uh, for, for many people, the, the goal of life is a good retirement program, you know, good health insurance, getting your kids to, if you have any, to a good college. And that's kind of it. Yeah. And that, that, that's, that's it? 
you know, a good retirement place, and and then you die. You know, <laughs> what's that worth? So that's depressing. But and I'm I'm kind of uh, it's a sweet, that's a sort of sweeping generalization, but it's not far off. And so it's no surprise that people are, are, are really depressed because culturally we don't have a lot to look forward to. The, the goals that we have, it's, it's like, well, oh, I want the best for my kids, but then even what is good for the kids is a you know, good education and a nice house to live in, and that's it. So one, in terms of goals, uh, I feel, I mean, it's a bit of a tall order, but I feel that it's one of the really useful things that can be brought into the education system and the spiritual domain uh, is to very, be much more conscious of our, our spiritual potential as human beings. To actually talk about sainthood. <laughs> you know, the <laughs> enlightenment. You know, the, 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 uh, as a, a child, you can look forward to uh, um, not just coping or a, a, kind of a comfortable house in a nice suburb or a, a, in a cottage in the Cotswolds you know, with, with uh, cabbages and carrots in the garden and goats under the apple trees. But you can, you can look forward to uh, the, a quality of, of freedom and well-being for yourself and that also your life can be a source of great blessings and benefit for, for many others, not just in terms of their physical well-being, but similarly helping others to find that quality of of a, uh, of a sp in really spiritual abundance. The, um, I, I was in, invited to a, a conference on mindfulness in, uh, in Amsterdam this, uh, this summer, and I already had a really packed schedule of going to like, about eight different countries in, in four months. And, uh, but then I got this invite and they said, could you talk about stream entry? <laughs> And this is a, a, an academic conference about 600 psychologists and, and therapists. Uh, and they said, could you talk about stream entry at like the first level of enlightenment? I said, really? And they said, yeah, because uh, I, he said, I, I saw this book of yours and I think this is a, a useful thing to talk about in terms of, of the development of mindfulness. Uh, so even though I had a really packed calendar, I thought, I'll do that. <laughs> because uh, I don't know, there's probably quite a few therapists and psychiatrists and ologists in this room. But the, the uh, DSM-4, the previous edition, the Diagnostic, Diagnostic and St Statistical Manual, was about 1,999 and a half pages on pathologies and half a page on well-being. <laughs> the DSM-5 apparently has about 150 pages, or a couple of hundred pages on well-being, but still 1,900, yeah, yeah, 1,950 on, or 850 on, on pathologies. But well-being is kind of like not being sick. <laughs> and so what we have in the Buddhist tradition is like it, it, the, the, the qualities of well-being are quite... Um, thoroughly articulated and, and degrees of, of not just coping but you know, uh, well-being to the point of uh, ongoing kind of happiness and freedom and, uh, and a, a, a joy-filled, a joyful life. And that's just not talked about. That, that kind of uh, quality of uh, spiritual fulfillment uh, and the, the ways that one might go about achieving that through through what you do with your mind, not just how much money you have or what career you choose or who you get um, partnered with, but what you do with your mind moment by moment. That's just not in the curriculum. That's not, that's not in the society. So, uh, again, it's a bit of a tall order, but um, I really like to <laughs> get that into the, into the, 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 the meme pool <laughs> of society. <laughs> That that's possible for us. That uh, uh, when when people uh, when kids are going to school, you know, primary school, secondary school, people, college kids, people in the workplace, that 
this is something that is meaningful and practical to work towards not just coping but rather to uh, to see that as a human being we ha you have the potential we have the potential for you know, for uh, you know, a, a, a kind of over um, arching happiness and a sense of, of peace and contentment and freedom we can do that we, we have that possibility uh, I was saying to some people uh, yesterday I think uh, the um, when I was a, a college student, I did I did a psychology degree in London University, and in the um, I think it was the very first term or the first couple of terms we were there, we were doing a, a course on Freud, and we were um, one of the very early lectures that, that we had on on Freud, the um, uh, the ending of his uh, his first book, the Interpretation of Dreams. I think that was his first book. He makes a statement. The, the, the best that my method can do is to transform your neurotic misery into ordinary human unhappiness. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was, a, I was an eight, a kind of a hairy 18-year-old. Something in my heart said, no, we can do better than that. I'm not going to settle for ordinary human unhappiness. You know, so I was ready to argue with Freud at the age of, eight, age of 18. So I w modesty was never my strong suit. <laughs> but it just, it was a very uh, so intuitive you know, <laughs> lurch of the heart. Like, no, you can do better than that. But society, it doesn't look much beyond that. You know, if, if you can, ordinary human unhappiness without causing too much trouble, great. <laughs> you know, if we can kind of get by without causing too much uh, difficulty and too many disasters. And that, I, I, but we can do better than that. So in terms of goals, then uh, I, say, I would say uh, looking to that potential that we have, and then if that manifests as a lot of activity in the world that affects other people in a direct way, like you know, creating... Um, uh, institutions or medicines or art forms or writing the great novel uh, or um, the uh, creating music or whether it, uh, and that sort of affects directly the minds of millions of people or whether it's just how you function in your own little sphere and how that the ripples go out I'd say that that's secondary really. it's not just the sort of the grand performances that make a difference the, um, the it can be just the way that you, the way that you function in in your own little sphere, um, and that can have a very powerful effect. Like uh, uh, Satish Kumar, who's a, a very um, highly regarded spiritual teacher, writer in in the UK, isn't it? He was a Jain monk um, who uh, walked from India to. He walked to all of the the nuclear, the capitals of the nuclear powers, and gave the leaders of the governments tea. It's very either Indian or English gesture. As <laughs> a encouraging world peace. Anyway, he became a spiritual teacher and um, very influential, very respected. Uh, and uh, he said his major spiritual influence was his mother, um, who was um, uh, unable to read and write. She was a, a poor, Rajas I think, Rajasthani um, a, a woman, a villager, and. Um, and he said most of what of the spiritual qualities that he developed he learned from from his mother and uh, and he <coughs> he said that uh, as they were growing up then uh, uh, two or three of his sisters they were quite good sewers uh, they used to make you know, dresses and clothes and things and so they left the village and gone off to, to to work in the local town and so they were they they were able to collect some money and they and they said that uh, he said how Two or three of his sisters came back to the village and said, "You know, uh, said, Mom, you know, we've uh, we've saved up some money. And we want to get you a sewing machine because you know you like to sew. We learned to sew from you, and we know that that's what you like to do best in the world." And she said, "No." <laughs> she said, and then she he said she held up this her her needle and said, "This can't break down." <laughs> and. Uh, and yes, you know, if I had a sewing machine, I could make more dresses and more clothes, and and uh, and that that would be more stuff. But she said, "What I uh, what's important to me 
is that with every stitch that I make, I'm thinking of the person that I'm making this for. I'm, I'm with the, the, the application of this, this stitch and this pattern and sewing on these, these kind of little spark, you know, sparkly <laughs> uh, flowers and things that go on the, on the clothes. And she, and she said, why, why would I want to make more of them if I can't pay attention to what I'm doing in the same way? And so, oh, that's just one example. So, uh, uh, so she, <laughs> Satish Kumar's mother, who can't even read and write, and, um, um, she's probably passed away by now because he's quite elderly, but there she was in her little village in Rajasthan having this major effect on the spiritual life of, <laughs> of everyone who's Satish Kumar affected. And so, yeah, the, the, the ripples of what we do and how we are can, can radiate out. So I, I, don't, I don't feel that having a big effect has to be something that makes the cover of Time magazine or mm-hmm. is something particularly visible. Just the, the way that you function, you know, just being the guy at the gas station who is always friendly, <laughs> is always helpful, never panics. <laughs> That uh, that could be, the, you know, by just literally just by being the the guy at the gas station who's always there and is the sort of reliable presence, that can be a great gift to the world. I don't know if you do work in a gas station, possibly <laughs> probably not, but uh, and that uh, some very humble activity, uh, even though it it might not seem like much, uh, just the way you do that, the way you are in that. Uh, you touch others' lives, and that's not a small thing. That's a, that's a, that can be a powerful thing. Is that enough for this evening? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's probably a good enough note to end on.